Welcome to the last month at the Federal Circuit, a look at recent Federal Circuit decisions impacting the intellectual property community. Finnegan Partners Beth Farrell and Trenton Ward join us now to offer insight into the recently decided case Serona Dental Systems versus Institute Strauman AG and its potential implications for practice before the PTAB. Beth, this case is an appeal from the PTAB's decision in an IPR involving a patent directed to a method related to tooth implant surgery. Could you tell us a little bit about the case? Originally, there were actually three petitions related to this particular patent. In two of the three cases, Serona, the patent owner, prevailed. In this one, the patent owner had two of the claims upheld by the board, but claims one through eight were found to be unpatentable. The patented method is a bit unpleasant, I think. It's directed to producing a drill template for use in tooth implant surgery. Essentially, the method involves trying to precisely place a pilot hole in order to make sure that you're putting the implant in the proper location. And one important part of the method is is that it involves taking a three-dimensional optical measurement of the jaw. This case involves obviousness. And as a result, there are two references that are important to focus on. The first is Banisher. And Banisher disclosed all the elements except for a three-dimensional optical measurement. And the second reference was the TRUP reference, which disclosed this optical measurement. One complication was that the Banisher reference was in German originally. And so one issue that came up in the case was a potential conflict about the translation of a particularly important term. We're going to discuss two issues in this podcast. The first relates to the theory of obviousness that was relied on by the board, which the Federal Circuit affirmed, and the second relates to the board's denial of the patent owner's contingent motion to amend, on which the Federal Circuit decided to remand back to the board. Let's talk about the theory of obviousness. The board found that claims 1 through 8 would have been obvious based on Banisher and Trupp, and that the Federal Circuit affirmed. Why is this case noteworthy? Well, originally, the petitioner proffered a theory of obviousness based on this term, recording bow, which was actually a mistranslation from the original German. Uh, So it was this term, recording bow, that was in Banisher reference. But the board's holding in finding obviousness relied on another disclosure within Banisher. So not the recording bow, but rather something that Banisher talked about called the geometry data. And In doing so, the board used this term geometry data, which wasn't a term that explicitly appeared in the petition. And so as a result, on appeal, the patent owner took the position that the board had relied on a combination that had not been present in the petition. Initially, the Federal Circuit noted that the Supreme Court's holding in SAS versus Iancu requires that the IPR proceed, quote, in accordance with or in conformance to the petition, end quote. The Federal Circuit also noted that it's the petitioner's petition, not the director's discretion, that's supposed to guide the life of the IPR. So in that sense, the Federal Circuit agreed with the patent owner and fairly clearly stated that it would not be proper for the board to deviate from the grounds of the petition and raise its own obviousness theory. But that's where the Federal Circuit and the patent owner parted ways, because at that point, the Federal Circuit said that's not what happened here. What the Federal Circuit said was that they found that the petition discussed Banisher's 3D plaster models and cited to a particular section of the reference. And while the board did not use the exact same words that the petition used, the board is not required to do so, provided that the patent owner has adequate notice and an opportunity to respond. In fact, this is something that Judge Moore specifically asked the patent owner about during oral argument, citing to the In Re Nuvasis case, stating if there is adequate notice, then there shouldn't be an issue with relying on a different part of a reference. And as a result, in this case, the Federal Circuit found that the board did not violate the Administrative Procedures Act or was inconsistent with SAS. Trenton, is this consistent with Federal Circuit precedent? Perhaps the most interesting thing that I found about the Serona decision is that it does not address previous Federal Circuit precedent that seems to be, at least perhaps in contrast to a portion of the Federal Circuit instructions in Serona. Judge Moore says this in the Serona's decision, and I quote, it would thus not be proper for the board to deviate from the grounds in the petition and raise its own obviousness theory. Interestingly enough, the board has deviated 
from the petition in previous cases and been affirmed by the Federal Circuit in doing so. One example is the Federal Circuit's decision in 2015 in Sight Sound versus Apple. And in that case, the Federal Circuit affirmed a board decision which deviated from the grounds proposed in the petition. Specifically, the board created a new obviousness ground in its institution decision. An anticipation ground had been proposed in the petition, which the board was not persuaded on, but the board did institute upon a modification of that anticipation challenge as an obviousness challenge. And the Federal Circuit affirmed that ultimate finding of obviousness based upon that particular obviousness challenge. Another case that's well known to many involving a circumstance in which the board deviated from the petition is the Kuzo Speed Technologies versus Lee case involving an appeal from an AI trial. And in that particular case, when the case was in front of the board, the board instituted review on certain claims that were not expressly mentioned during the petition. Claim 17 was challenged in the petition, and ultimately the board instituted review not only on Claim 17, but also on the two claims from which Claim 17 depended ultimately determining that all three of those claims were unpatentable, and the Federal Circuit affirmed that finding, and the Supreme Court as well affirmed that finding, which would seem to be a deviation from the petition that was originally brought in those cases. What implications do you see for PTAB practice moving forward? It seems to me that most board panels will likely stick close to the grounds and the petition and the subject matter relied upon in the petition. And Judge Moore takes care to state twice in the opinion that Federal Circuit's determination that the board did not deviate from the grounds alleged in the petition and that in relying upon the disclosures did not deviate from uh, essentially the subject matter that had been relied upon in the petition. So it seems to me that most panels will look to stay close to the grounds that have been presented in a petition. There are other cases after the Supreme Court's institution decision in SAS that seem to reinforce this idea. The PGS geophysical case was a case in which the Federal Circuit recited the Supreme Court's statement that the SAS decision requires a review guided by a petition describing each claim challenge and the grounds the challenge to each claim is based. And it added that the director does not get to define the contours of the proceeding. So reinforcing their adoption of the SAS decision that it is the petitioner that is the master of the case and the master of the scope of review in front of the PTAB. In the PGS decision, the Federal Circuit stated that it reads the SAS opinion as interpreting the statute to require a simple yes or no institution choice, embracing all challenges included in the petition. And we've seen no basis for a contrary understanding of the statute in light of SAS. Therefore, it seems in view of the Federal Circuit decision in PGS and other cases that the board has a binary decision to make on institution with respect to instituting the case on all grounds and all claims that were brought in the petition or not instituting altogether. Let's move to the second issue in the decision, the board's denial of the patent owner's contingent motion to amend. Beth, could you walk us through that issue and the court's reasoning? It's important to understand that this final written decision was issued by the board prior to the Aqua Products decision. So to that extent, there was a general understanding amongst everyone about that. And so I think it was fairly understood, at least how the first part of this would play out. What happened was the patent owner proposed making a number of amendments to its independent claim number one, and the board denied the motion. And in doing so, the Federal Circuit found that the board had erred. On appeal, the patent owner argued the board had improperly placed the burden on the patent owner to prove that the proposed substitute claims were patentable. This is in contrast to what the Federal Circuit stated in this opinion, and I quote, that the petitioner bears the burden of proving that the proposed amendment claims are unpatentable. End quote. And in this case, Federal Circuit cited to Aqua Products. I think you'll find out in a minute when Trenton talks about Aqua Products that this isn't exactly the same reading that he may have on that case. The other issue that came up as part of this contingent motion to amend was that the patent owner argued that the board improperly rejected the proposed substitute claims based on a combination of references that were not raised by the petitioners and that even if 
using a combination of such references was proper that the patent owner did not receive notice and an opportunity to respond. So this echoes a similar type of argument that they had made with respect to the first part of the case. In this case, the Federal Circuit declined to consider whether the board may consider a combination of references not argued by the petitioner in opposing the motion to amend the claims and instead left this to the board to decide in the first instance under SAS and the requirements of the APA if doing so was acceptable. And finally, Trenton, how do you interpret the Federal Circuit's decision in Serona and how will it impact board determinations on motions to amend? Well, similar to the odd silence on our first issue with respect to Federal Circuit decisions regarding the discretion of the board to deviate from the petition, I found it interesting that the Serona decision simply provides a very short and sweet site to the Aquaproducts case and no further description about the assignment of burdens with respect to motions to amend. And if you look back at the majority opinion in Aqua, you find that the majority decision provides what is somewhat of a rather narrow holding on the basis that the board had not properly adopted a rule placing the burden on the patent owner, and thus the board could not place the burden on the patent owner with respect to a motion to amend. And specifically, the majority decision in Aqua stated that all the rest, and I'm quoting, all the rest of our cogitations, whatever label we have placed on them, are just that, cogitations, end quote. So interestingly, ACWA does not specifically state that the burden is on the petitioner. A few weeks after the Federal Circuit's decision in ACWA, there was a decision in Bosch versus Mittal, a decision authored by Judge Chen. In Bosch, the Federal Circuit decided to the ACWA decision for the proposition that where the challenger ceases to participate in the IPR and the board proceeds to final judgment, it's the board that must justify any finding of unpatentability by reference to the evidence in the IPR. Thus, it seems, at least with respect to questions where the petitioner is no longer part of the proceeding, the board does have the capability to justify an unfinding of patentability by citing to evidence of record. Our guests have been Beth Farrell and Trenton Ward, partners at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.